When we launched V1 in June 2021, we didn't have a lot of traction. We made a lot of assumptions and we thought everything should be on-chain. An end-to-end -end transaction would cause a user maybe $1,000 in gas fees. That was a moment of realization for me because... Tian Li, the co-founder at Pendle Finance, a decentralized project pioneering yield tokenization on Ethereum. Enabling users to trade yield and earn fixed yield on their assets. Why did you leave Kyber at the end of 2018? Uh, we started out in 2017 and we wanted to lead the charge of decentralized exchange. Comparatively, in 2018, a good day for Kyber was maybe $50,000 when Binance or some other spot exchanges were doing hundreds of millions or even billions. We worked on many different product ideas. All of them didn't work out. How many did you try? We wanted to explore cold brew business. We thought there could potentially be an interest in a different type of bean origins in Singapore. It was a completely radical idea and I was fascinated by it. I started out crypto as a hobbyist, I came across a product that utilized Bitcoin as an avenue for remittance. At one point in time, we were $10 million in FTV. We also experimented with NFT marketplaces. We are currently approaching close to $7 billion in TVL. A bulk of that was because of... So you started Pendo a couple of years ago, but you've done other things in your life that some people might not necessarily be aware of, right? Yeah. Who are you? How far do you want to go back? You decide. 75% <laughs> of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel. Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana, Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer 2 with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury, and Astar Network, a scalable network connecting people to Web3 through entertainment, blockchain development, and community events. Raul was asking him when we all met, he was asking him, how do you keep the value of a token high mm. through time? And then we talk for two hours, <laughs> right? How do you, because there's so much volatility. Yeah. What's the kind of secret or kind of thing to that, that a founder of like a pretty substantial protocol should think about, because you might say, as the other day we talked about, right? You said, hey, I'm not really, I don't want to comment on like price, or which makes sense. But at the end of the day, the price of the token is kind of like the ultimate marketing tool, right? Yeah. So and so if the thing goes down 97%, you can do the best job in the world in terms of protocol. People are not going to like it. Yeah. We, we don't comment on it publicly. We, mm. we definitely have, we, we definitely observe it as a, tracker of sort, right? Mm -hmm. So we will do activities to grow the fundamental metrics. Uh, and hopefully it can translate to the price because ultimately, like you said, the price is the best marketing tool. When we were, I remember, sorry, is this? We're starting here. Yeah, we started. Okay. We'll cut the beginning where we started. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, but basically I think when we were in the early part of last year, mm -hmm. so this was, okay, um, just a little bit of history, right? Pendle at the lowest was around three cents. Today we are probably around five to $7. It can be very volatile. Mm -hmm. um, but at three cents, growing the protocol um, up to, I'd say like the first, uh, uh, to the 20 cents mark was incredibly difficult. I'd say like maybe more so than the run that we had this year. And the reason was because like when you're small, nobody really paid attention to it. So we had to figure out ways to get people to talk about Pendle. Um, and I think we had the first major boost when our good friend Alex Fanovic, through his public wallet, bought some Pendle tokens. Mm. So that, actually I think that gave a lot of confidence to to the to the community um and i think from there on it 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 really started to compound 
Yeah. So uh, thanks, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> he um so 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 does it mean because this conversation uh, we had like between closed door with uh, Raul and um, Mia was Raul was basically saying, hey, how do you keep a token valuable through time, right? Through multiple cycle. And Mia was just basically saying anything that is fundamentally driven is, is utility of the protocol. Mm. It just gives a non-zero value to your protocol, right? But it's that. Whether you make good revenue or whatever, the actual premium on the top is attention. Yes. And that's it, right? And it's what you're saying that with Alex is that you could have basically built the best protocol, but no one cares. And until there is someone in the space who is kind of like public enough, yeah. who is giving this first kind of kick, and then you have the you get the ball rolling. I think this is also in retrospect, this has been, I think, a core part of our strategy. So we have a couple of things that we focus on when we launch Panel V2. So V2 was launched December of 2022. And over like during this period, we made like four different emphasis, right? So first, like we needed to make sure that the product is iterative because whatever we pushed out to the public, it's not going to be the end state. It We will interact with end users. And then through these interactions, we gather data points and then we have to continue to improve on the product. Now, the second part, which is an investment in like the BD and growth efforts, really, really made a difference mm. between V2 and V1 because V1 uh, product was complex. And the learning curve for most people was very, very steep for Pendo at least, right? V2, we invested a lot in educational materials. And then we made sure that we work on the distribution outlets as well. Because like, again, I think in crypto, we're not short of products that have very meaningful technology, but because of the lack of distribution outlet or people don't talk about them enough, they don't get the attention and then they... Mm kind of just become irrelevant over time. So there's this saying in actually it comes from Silicon Valley, right? Which is the first time founders, they focus on the product. The second time founder, they focus on the distribution. <laughs> and, and that makes the whole difference, right? And they realize, oh man, I can build the best product in the world, but if no one gives a fuck, it's probably not going to be a success. Yep. Whereas you can build an average product or a good product, but if the if the distribution is on point, mm. then it's going to make a massive difference. Yeah. So the product has to still be good. It has mm. to be the baseline foundation for people to even want to utilize it, right? But then the, the, the rest of it is really just how you get it to the right target audience. And then like for us, we've also been very, very active in, in a way like expressing a view on the kind of trends and narratives that we want to work on. Mm. So I remember... So Stan Druckenmiller, I think uh, one of the speeches that he delivered a while back, he, it, th there was a segment that he says, because he's a macro trader, he doesn't really care about what businesses, sectors to focus on. He cares about what the feds think, the central banks across the different regions, the, the different big, big, like big powers. Um, and, and then try to identify the liquidity flow. And then he slots himself in there to try to capture some of these opportunities. And I think in the same way, right, like as crypto founder, sorry, uh, protocol founders, we, we also have to think about positioning of the protocol in a similar nature as well. Mm. Um, for, for us, we identified, like in the earlier part of last year, we identified LST, to be one of the more dominant trends of uh, the year mm. because um, Lido, Rocket ETH, and a couple of others started showing up. And um, it's true that a lot of people who are involved in DeFi have ETH. So they wanted to utilize the ETH to generate some yield. So that was a view that we took. And the first instance of us getting some sort of visibility was by affiliating the brand with some of the more dominant players in that particular segment. So I remember in January last year, we 
figure out a way to partner up with Rocket Pool, Balancer, and Aura. And then four of us collectively marketed mm. a, a new product line. So if, if, if I were to look at it, right, in the last one and a half years of running Pendle, the product hasn't changed. It's really how we leverage on different narratives to try to position ourselves fig by figuring out the big money movements uh, from one trend to the other and, and really inserting ourselves to, to help our users capitalize on these opportunities, we, we grow as well. Mm. Yeah, and then of course, like after, after um, LST, we also capitalize on Arbitrum. We also capitalize on, I mean, more recently this year was really restaking narrative. So figuring out the place where we are expecting majority of the liquidity or capital to flow in this sector and how we can best position ourselves to help our users make make wealth um, or express a view. That, that's that been, I think, a, a core anchor of how we think about positioning. So you started Pendo a couple of years ago, hmm. but you've done other things in your life before that. <laughs> that some people might not necessarily be aware of, right? Yeah. Who are you? How far do you want to go back? <laughs> you decide. Yeah, well, so I think like, um, I, 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 I think, so I, I, I started out in uh, crypto as a hobbyist. Mm. Um, this was when I was still a student and I was a research assistant for a professor. And he tasked me to look into the different fintech business models as part of the research for his coursework. So I looked into it and I came across a product that utilized Bitcoin as an avenue for remittance between Singapore and the Philippines. So TransferWise or WISE was already in existence then and they were really big. But I thought what this company was doing, it, it's, it's called Toast. I, I think it's, it's no longer around. Mm -hmm. um, they were using Bitcoin to do the money transfer and the price that they were offering to customers was a fraction of what Wise, Wise offered. Now I can't remember exactly what it was, but I thought it was a fascinating technology altogether because the way I looked at it, right? Wise was in a, innovating, um, it was more like an incremental innovation in, in the business model, right? So they have credits on one side and then like the money doesn't really cross border. It's just credit and debiting of uh, money in a, in a certain jurisdictions, depending on the, the target. So they have multiple different endpoints and then they rebalance every day. Whereas like in the case of Bitcoin, it was a completely radical idea and I was fascinated by it. So uh, that, that was, I think, my first interaction with crypto and then I went deeper into it. Um, but fast forward, I was also like, because I'm not technical. So to get involved in a space that was highly technical at that point in time. What do you mean by I'm not technical? So I, I was a business major. Ah. I was a business major with some understanding in, in okay. finance and, and marketing, right? Very, very, very typical, I think, um, uh, profile. Um, not typical in crypto, definitely not typical. Fair Especially enough. not as a founder. Yeah. So mm. I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I took up courses to learn about coding, but I'm never, a, I, I, I don't aspire to be a great coder. Mm -hmm. And in a, I think back in 2014, 15, crypto was extremely technical. Um, and of course, my first interaction with, with, with Ethereum was through the white paper around then. Um, learning about it. So my current, one of my current co-founders, um, we have been friends for a long time. So we actually knew each other about 20 years ago today. Mm -hmm. We lived together then uh, and we decided to venture into this technology, not knowing too much about technicalities of it. So the first implementation for us was actually to 
mined, mined Ethereum. So we got some GPUs and then mined, um, mined some Ethereum using, using mining pools. Uh, I think it was F2P at that point in time. But of course, like we, 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 we mined some assets um, and then shortly after, right? Like 2016, 2017 period, it was an extremely good time uh, because it was an ICO period. Mm. So we took out all the assets that we mined and we started flipping ICOs because of better return. Mm. But turns out, I think it was, it was actually a bad decision um, because we were relatively decent with entries, but we were really terrible with exits. Meaning you keep too long? Yes. Yeah, you just We became all. the exit liquidity, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so and, and I'd say like that was formative years. And then I went through another cycle in the um, like 21, 22 period. And then I learned it that like more recently, just stick with Bitcoin and ETH, maybe Solana as well. And, and you don't have to do too many things because most of us are not like good token or st uh, like as like um, token or coin pickers we shouldn't have to do that we should just stick with the the blue chips and then be comfortable with it um yeah but i i started professionally in crypto actually through kyber so i joined as one of the founding team members and it was one of the best things to happen to me because everything i learned about sorry everything i know about finance was a result of that opportunity um, so I worked very closely with Loy, definitely with Miao as well. Mm. Uh, we were just a bunch of guys with some ideas, um, trying to figure out ways to be relevant in a fast growing environment. Yeah. This was 2017? Yes. 2017, 20 2018, right? Yes, correct. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought the, the entire experience was extremely inspiring because of, of, I think because of that opportunity, I had the chance to travel more broadly and then met with very interesting and capable people. Mm. So that, that motivates me even more to want to um, do well, mm. um, focusing on my strengths and then try to maybe leverage on someone else's, come together and, and, and do something meaningful. Yeah. You told me you left Kyber at the end of 2018, which was also pretty much the bottom of the bear market, right? Yes. I think November, Bitcoin went from 6K to 3K. Yes. Then everybody was kind of like depressed. Why did you leave Kyber at the end of 2018? And, and obviously, like, I'm not going to say, hey, the question is not like, hey, why did you leave at the bottom? Yeah. But it's more put that in perspective with what you learned afterwards right yeah that played a big part in pendle current success yeah of course so i think so i left kyber at the end of 2018 um for one okay it, it was it was because there were so many things that were happening around then right mm -hmm. uh we had multiple different types of l1s this was eos tezos a lot of them might not be very relevant now but they were they were pretty big protocols at that mm. point in time. And of course, um, the other aspect was like, we started out in 2017 and we wanted to be, we wanted to lead the charge of decentralized exchange. But comparatively, I think in 2018, a good day for Kyber was maybe $50,000, $100,000 in daily trading volume when Binance or some other spot exchanges were doing maybe hundreds of millions or even billions. Mm. So there's a big disparity. There was a big disparity between the two different types of exchanges. Um, and I just couldn't figure out ways, um, or rather I think in retrospect, I would, I would think of myself as being unimaginative uh, because I was, again, looking at it from the present perspective mm. and not really thinking far to see what it could potentially become. So I think this was a very important lesson for me. And yeah. So basically you're kind of like FOMOing into other things, right? Like I'm doing something here, mm. it's interesting, but it's not picking up. And these other things are kind of like more successful right now. Yes. 
I'm probably therefore I'm probably doing the wrong thing, right? Yeah. So there, there, there are definitely push and pull forces, right? The pull because someone else is doing it much better, mm. and then the push was, yeah, uh, like um, we are we on the right track? Mm. Yeah, I uh, wasn't sure, so there was a lot of doubt, and this was me. Not too long after school, and and not having a lot of experience, and not having that resolution to see through the things that we wanted to build. Mm. So I left Kyber um, and set up a small team with my current set of co-founders to explore different ideas. Um, so we worked on many different product ideas. Sometimes crypto related, sometimes not crypto related, and <clears throat> I'd say all of them didn't work out. Um, how until, many? How many did you try? Dude, I don't even remember. It was <laughs> a lot. Look, I, I'll give you some examples. Right, we wanted to explore cold brew business. Interesting. This was <laughs> nothing related to crypto. This was, <laughs> this was just an interest in coffee, and we thought, okay, so we actually took a trip to Laos. Because, um, you know, like coffee producing countries in Southeast Asia, not that many, right? Uh, Laos happens to be one of the Arab, uh, like just Arabica beans producers mm. in the region. And then of course, like the, on the other, the other side, there's, there's, there's uh, Vietnam. So we thought um, there could potentially be an interest in a different type of bean origins in Singapore, considering that there were so many different uh, coffee shops here. So we actually have a friend who runs a farm in Laos and we visited him to see if it's a viable business opportunity. That didn't work out, that import business didn't work out, but we were considering different profiles of cold brew that could potentially be sold to um, like coffee shops or uh, retail. And then we basically become, um, yeah, just, just a supplier. Mm. That didn't work out. We also tried um, kit for cheesecakes. I know, I know. <laughs> no, what well, the reason I'm I'm the reason I'm loathing is because I love coffee, and I love cheesecakes basically. So, and I think the even I had multiple ideas around building businesses around coffee. And when I was two thousand six, two thousand six, I went to the US and I discovered discovered Cheesecake Factory and I was like, I uh, need to bring this concept back to Europe. Yeah. I was like, it's so amazing, right? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, there was already some guys on, on it <laughs> and everything, but like, okay, so <laughs> for cheesecake. Look, so so Love it. I, yeah, of course, like these were the things we like as well, right? Um, so I, I think we we weren't set to want to make these into big businesses, yeah. but we wanted a way to generate some income stream so that we can continue to explore different business ideas. So again, like during that period, in order, because it was it was bear market, I had some savings, but it wasn't like a massive amount of money. So I needed to, as much as possible, increase my runway. So these were the ideas that we explored, didn't work out. But of course, like along the, along the way, I picked up some part-time job as well. So I was a swimmer, I taught swimming, because it, mm. it's it's actually a pretty lucrative mm. side gig. So I, I taught swimming, kids, uh, adults as well. Not not so many of them, but but it was it was it paid the bill. And then I also became a lifeguard because it was like the easiest job ever. Uh, in a pool, okay. So not not to discriminate against any kind of lifeguards, but the pool that I was assigned to had no 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 guests at all for the entire day. So there was nothing to look at, right? It was just me sitting in a room to try to get my work done, that's it. Um, to, every, every, every minute that I sat in there, uh, it, it was just like some, some, some money for, for my uh, expenditure. Mm. Uh, I also did slides for someone else on Fiverr mm. to try to- So you were a Fiverr contract, like a yeah, Fiverr yeah, contractor? Yeah, yeah. So all these little gigs to try to sustain that, um, that, that dream and hope of building something meaningful. Mm. Yeah. And then 2020 happened, right? Yes. DeFi summer. Yes. And <clears throat> what's really important to understand here is, I think based on what we talked about before uh, the other day is, it's the moment you, re you had a big realization, right? Regarding decentralized exchange. 
and kind of like your mindset on how a founder should think about yes. being early in a trend. Yes. Yeah, so I think it was an important realization because 2020 DeFi summer was the the tipping point for a lot of products that came out in 2017. So Uniswap 2017, 2018 period, and then ETH Land, which eventually became Aave mm -hmm. and then Compound, all of them came out around 2017, 18 period. And it took them about two to three years to get to a state where they became really, really important. And they hit the, basically they hit the product market fit. Mm -hmm. So for me, that, that, that was, that was a moment of realization for me. It was, um, I think it was extremely memorable because I didn't think money market was needed when, when I was at the spot of say, uh, at, at Kyber, we didn't see a lot of transaction. And if no one else is trading, who's going to need a money market? Who's mm -hmm. going to lend and borrow? I, I didn't, I, I couldn't make sense of it. And then, you know, a couple of years later in 2020, I realized I was the one that was not thinking big. So I was actually quite adamant not to repeat that again, because that has cost me quite substantial, uh, not so much in, I mean, not just monetarily, right? But time for me to work on something meaningful. Mm. Yeah. So I, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's probably an, an, an important point here, which is it's kind of a double-edged word because on one side you're realizing, hey, the big ideas, they, I could be working on the right thing, but not know it, right? And then if I, if I give up too early, I shoot myself in the foot, I lost time and I missed out on a massive opportunity that I had found already, right? Yes. The other one is I could be working on something that's completely Useless. When do you throw the towel? Mm. Uh, it's it's always a very difficult question. I truth is I don't know, um, but I would say like my my experience with Pendle, right? Because we started out in twenty twenty, mm. we stuck through, and this is going to be the fourth year we run Pendle, so. Um, Actually, for me, I thought the first two years of low adoption period was relatively easy to get through because I think for me, it was mostly anchoring the state of crypto to a mature state of a financial sector, right? And for me, in I, I think uh, in any financial sector, people who are managing money would value certainty, but it was largely absent in crypto. So if we are able to create an instrument that allows people some form of certainty, I think it should have, it should see decent adoption. So that's one. Mm -hmm. I think another layer is more internal. When we thought about the idea of building a product like Pendle, it was because of our innate need to get some form of certainty as well. Because Look, we like the 10, 20,000% APY, but there's also another side of us that want to know that if we put $1 today, we can get $2 out, like say in a year's time. Mm. That certainty is actually quite invaluable. And it, again, it was largely absent in crypto. So because, because of our own conviction in that particular perspective, um, we sustained and we continued on to build what we thought would make sense um, to the to the space and, and I think for me I've always been motivated to work on products that could deliver impact at scale and I thought that was a pretty meaningful problem statement to work on because mm. if we can I think if we can deliver that product successfully we could enable more types of use cases I think we can also enable we can potentially reduce the cost of capital and that could have a widespread application across the board. Hey, Windshift Happens family. Time to toast our partner, Divin. They're taking luxury wine to the blockchain with their super fun concept called Uncork to Earn. Buy your favorite wines, enjoy unique experiences, and get an airdrop each time you open a bottle with your friends. Cheers to Divin for bringing transparency, authenticity, and exclusivity to the fine wines industry. 
So one of the big realizations <laughs> is things take time. I should not give up too early if I really believe in my thing, right? Yes. That you learn through the Kyber experience. Yes. Because Kyber and decentralized finance happened two years after, two years later than basically when you kind of uh, left it. Yeah. There's two other big realizations that you had in the last 10 years. The first one is uh, you were thinking, and it's really interesting because I was the same. <laughs> Maybe it's an ego problem, I don't know. Like you were actually thinking that everyone should start a business, right? Yeah. When you were younger, yeah. you were thinking, and I remember when I was 23, I started my first company and I was like, every day I was thinking the same. I was like, I don't understand why not everyone is starting a, co a company. It doesn't make sense to me that not everyone is starting, is not, is starting a company, right? Yes. You were thinking the same. Yes. Why did you change your mind? <laughs> it actually doesn't make any sense to think like that, but. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think it actually takes a lot of grit um, and it takes a certain kind of personality to, to get things done. Like we're, we're talking about running a business uh, and charting into, and like trying to get into an uncharted territory. So you need to have, I mean, first of all, self-belief, very strong self-belief. And then you need to also convey that to other people so that they can join you in that particular mission. Um, and at some point in time, you need to be able to convince a broader audience to utilize uh, the product um, because it can be meaningful to them. So, and, and along the way, we're going to encounter a lot of uh, challenges and obstacles. Like for example, this guy suddenly throws in a towel and doesn't want to work anymore. What do you do? Do you break down and cry mm -hmm. and then give up? Or do you go look out for solutions, patch it, and then keep moving forward? So I think it really does take a certain kind of character to be able to execute with, um, with, so, many, with, with so many known and unknown challenges. Um, uh, another thing is I, I have also come to realize, um, do you know Ratatouille, the the animated picture, the movie? Yeah, 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 yeah. So so they have a <laughs> they have a very famous line, right? So, but eventually at the end of it, the critic, he commented that um, he thinks that anyone can cook. Sorry, not every, not everyone can cook, but a good cook can come from everywhere. Mm. So, so I I I I believe that as well, right? Um, Interesting, because it's it's linked to the second point, second realization, right? Yes, you don't have to come from Silicon Valley to start something big. Yes. So okay. So this was this was also I think um, a realization for me, but this was in 2016. Mm. So I grew up, like this was before I came to Singapore. This was a long time ago. I was actually a pretty competent swimmer. Mm. And I was, I represented my state at some point in time. I represented the country. In at, Malaysia. In Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, at, at like age groups, like uh, regional age groups. So competed in Thailand. Um, so I was, I was one of the top candidates for some events in, in the country train really hard for it. And I remember very vividly when I was growing up, like during the seven to 12 years old, I, I only had a dream. I wanted to be an Olympian and I wanted to win a medal at the Olympics. This didn't matter like whether it's first, second or third, right? Mm -hmm. But to be at the podium representing the country was, I thought was one of the most meaningful things that, that I could do. But of course, uh, so over time, I think as I, as I grew and had a bit more exposure and realized that like becoming a swimmer is actually very, very difficult. I started to lose faith um, and, and dismiss that, that, that idea of having the ability um, to, to win. So eventually I changed. Um, in short, I ditched that ambition and I went uh, an, another trail. <clears throat> Why do you ditch it concretely? I, I didn't believe in, in, in that dream. Why do you think you were not believing in your dream? Because there was no precedence. 
mm. because no one else from our region, like just say like in Southeast Asia, even made it to the finals at the Olympics. It was always say the US, Aussies, some Europeans, some Japanese, some Chinese, but the dominant swimmers were always from that few countries. Japan, maybe one or two good swimmers, but the rest of it is really kind of not so good. And mm -hmm. then China, sometimes no one from Southeast Asia. And I'm, I, I was born, raised in Southeast Asia. Um, and then 2016 was when Joseph Schooling from Singapore, mm -hmm. born, raised here, won the gold medal. And I thought the- In the Olympics. At the Olympics, yeah. beating Michael Phelps, Chad Leclo, and Las yeah. Loche. It was an incredible, I think these days, when I wanted additional motivation, I would look at the race to, to get myself motivated because he he was probably the, the, the youngest of the, of the lot, right? And he beat, the, uh, typically in a, in a swimming race, there's a gold medalist, silver medalist, and a bronze medalist. Now, it was very interesting, not just because Joseph Schooling won the race at record time, it was one gold medalist and three silver medalists. So I thought it was, uh, it, it, the, the odds of that happening was extremely low. It, it, was, it was a pretty interesting race. But more than that, I think it, it really proved me wrong in the, in the biggest way possible, but also in the best way possible. Because I came from a background of, uh, I, I had a similar kind of background. Mm. And the difference between Joseph and me, aside from flair, um, I, I think he, he must have been a much better swimmer than I was. But more importantly, I think it's just having that belief that he could, he could one day become a gold medalist at the Olympics. Uh, I didn't have that. I looked, I, I was basing, basing it on historical data and didn't find any patterns. So I kind of dismissed it. He, he was, he was, he, he went the other way, right? Um, no one else, um, no one else before him did it, but he went went ahead with it anyways, and he achieved it. So in all honesty, I think he is one of my biggest heroes because he showed me that indirectly, he showed me that if you think big enough and with enough conviction, sometimes things can happen. Mm. Do you think it's a resource or a mindset problem? So, I think resource has to be there. Mm. Uh, that that is like the, that 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 is the the foundation, the baseline. You need to be good in something. But then, after a certain stage, it's really just about mindset. Mm. You got to believe that you can do it, and you will figure out ways to 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 get get it done. Absolutely, and then the mindset will get you to know other people with the same mindset. We're talking about Lori before. Yes. We're talking about Meow, right? We just hang out with these dudes like, Meow is a fucking machine. Like he's just always like, bah, 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 like, right? And he pulls you up, right? Yeah. And so the more you, the, the hard thing is, and it's the same for me, I'm from a village in Switzerland, right? Switzerland is great, but there's not much happening. So in the beginning, for a very long time, the only thing you have to get into those circle is, your mindset and kind of self-belief and just trying. And then once you get with these people, you get into another dimension just because you're surrounded by these people. Yes, surrounded up by people who have been there. Mm. Uh, so um, I think another very formative experience for me was actually Cumberland Summit in 2018. So this was when I was already in crypto. Mm. Um, so Cumberland is one of the largest OTC desk uh, for crypto globally. and they organize a summit here in Singapore for a couple of days leading up to F1. Now, so they had, because of their influence, they invited, I think a total of 100 guests to the event. And then for some reason, I was one of them. Now, in that room, there were so many, I, 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 I'm pretty sure everyone else in the room was more accomplished than, than I was. We're talking about CZ. We're talking about like Arthur Hayes, um, Joe Lubin. Mm. These are guys who have done, they, they're, they have, I think at this, at this point in time, they were all very 
uh, established already. Um, and I think being in, uh, and there was Wu Jihan as well. And being in the same room where people of, of, of certain successes are just like next to me. I thought that was incredibly inspiring because it's it's one thing, right? To see oh, Mark Zuckerberg, he's in Silicon Valley and then he's done Facebook, Meta, mm. and his net worth is whatever. He's got a product that, has, that serves like billions of users every day. That all feels very different, uh, distant. When at, at that point in time, I think in, in 2018, just sitting in the same room with uh, say CZ Wu Jihan, just maybe two seats next to me, it was it was extremely enlightening because they were all uh, they were all very successful founders, and they're all self made too, mm. and they're able to yeah just assert influence in the space in in a way that no one's done it before. And I, I actually look up to them and, and that, that gave me a lot of confidence that, um, yeah, I could do something as well. So you said you launched Pendle in 2020, right? And yeah. then you just tried different things. What is Pendle today? If you had to explain it to your mother, Tough question. <laughs> Very tough. My mother doesn't know that I'm doing Pendle. Why does she know about you? Well, she knows that I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know. I find it very. She knows I'm okay. It's 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 probably a um, you know Asian mindset. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like again, I, I I'm pretty sure she's not going to be an audience of this 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 recording, right? So I can say it quite freely. <laughs> I have a feeling that if she knows what I do, she's going to have, she will probably allocate some of her assets to help like uh, f for me to manage. And I don't want that responsibility. Why? Because it's family. And that's a really, really important point. Actually, I've done so. I mean, I think all of us have done the mistake before. Yeah. Why don't you want to help your mother? do well in crypto. <laughs> no, but like it's a fair, yeah, yeah. right? No, so I will support in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Like if if she needs financial aid in in any case, right? I will as 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 a filial son, I will I will do my best. But managing money is very different because I think uh, uh, this is like me speaking of it from my perspective. I think my mother is at the age or my parents, right? They're at the age where they have some amount left. And they have maybe, I don't know, another 20, 30 years. Mm. So that's sufficient. It's nice. Like if it's just uh, fixed rate stuff, if it's a uh, 5% just to keep, keep the pile growing gradually, that's fine. But if it involves taking risk and putting the savings at risk, I think that's quite irresponsible. Mm. Look, they are, they only have, because everyone at some point will have to move on. They have maybe, yeah, conservatively 30 years left. Mm. They should just enjoy it and not mm. having to have to grow that pile because no matter how much they grow, they only have that amount of time left to spend. So what does your mother think you do? <laughs> she actually doesn't know that I'm involved in crypto. That's so interesting. <laughs> Finance, IT, I'm, I'm, I'm an IT guy. <laughs> Yeah, that's all she needs to know. I think I had a similar story with uh, Arthur Cheong from Defiance. Oh. Like you were <laughs> saying, uh, they don't really know. What she like I don't really tell them. Otherwise, they would be scared. They yeah. would be worried for me, right? So I didn't, I don't. Yeah, I, mean, maybe, I mean, maybe now it's different. But like in the beginning, at least, he was like, I just lied. I just lied for a long time. I was not saying what I was doing because otherwise it would have been too worried for me, right? Yeah, no, that's true actually, because I had a period of time before um, before, before founding Pendle, before mm -hmm. we had any kind of fundraise, right? There was a period of time I was doing odd jobs. It was, they were all honest jobs, mm -hmm. but I mean- But at, you're, you're not a banker, you're not yeah, an accountant. I, I'm right? not making bucks. Y yeah, you're not a lawyer, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is what most families 
want their kids to do, especially in, I guess, in Asia. Yeah. In Switzerland, it's the same, actually. Yeah, banks. So what the fuck are you doing, son? <laughs> yeah, you, you went to a school and then you... <laughs> Graduated with a degree. Why are you doing like all these things that does not require your your um, your knowledge from school? And yeah, we, yeah, we have different aspirations, but I, I just wasn't. I think at that point in time, I probably wasn't the best best son in the family. Um, now now we're okay. Um, yeah, so so I think because of that experience, I, I kind of just went ahead with it, anyways. Do you have siblings? I do. I have are a they? sister, younger, uh, older sister, and and. Uh, Younger brother. Are they involved in crypto? My younger brother is. So, what is Pendle if you had to explain it to your sister, <laughs> to your older sister who doesn't do crypto? In short, it's an interest rate swap protocol. What does that mean? So, we tokenize the APYs of APRs, APYs of. Um, protocols and allow that to be traded. So as an example, Lido's STE is offering, is is um, maybe paying 4% AP, APY. That can be tokenized and be traded. So now let's say if you're the counterpart, you can purchase just the incoming yield and not having to care, care about the, the underlying principle. Mm -hmm. So that's what Pendle does. Now the same mechanics, uh, this 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 has been the vision that we started out, right? Like this was what we started out with in 2020. It hasn't changed, but the underlying implementation has changed when we launched V2. Mm. So you had this initial idea, but it's not the thing that really worked out the best, right? You said like what what you implemented with this new version is kind of similar, but like different implementation. Different, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so this is the challenge that I think working on a product that has no precedence because we make a lot of assumptions. We actually copied quite a lot of the UI UX from referencing other protocols. Uh, so these, for example, Uniswap was already very established then. There was a certain kind of layout that people were familiar with. Mm. And then there was Aave and Compound. Mm. So we were ba basically taking components here and there and then slap it onto our our layout with a lot of assumptions like mm. because we didn't have any kind of data points to work with we thought maybe users would care about this number because this is what we think um and and we have to we we have to go ahead with that but in reality maybe users don't care about it as much so we have to make adjustments so that's why i think one of them like this is also why it's important to have time. It's sorry. It's important for uh, some products, especially the nascent ones, where the where where they haven't really gotten product market fit to 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 take some time to figure out. Mm. Um, we yeah, it, it took us a good like two two and a half years or so to 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 get to the state that that we are currently at. But it was a lot of work behind the scene. We. We implemented, oh, okay. Actually, I think when we launched V1 in June 2021, we didn't have a lot of traction for a couple of reasons. The UI UX, as I explained, right, was terrible. Mm. Uh, it was extremely difficult to get into a position on Pendle. And at that point in time, just to give you an illustration, right? An end-to-end -end transaction would cost a, a user maybe a thousand dollars in gas fees, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. So um, we have since modified the contracts and optimize it. So we we delegated a lot of the work to the back end to to reduce the cost. But you know, first implementation, we made a lot of a, a lot of assumptions, and we thought everything should be on chain. Mm. Um, so it was very expensive, and mm. then. It was also a time when in 2021, it was bull market. Yeah. So we were competing for attention against so many other protocols that were doing much better than we were. Nobody cared about fixed rate when the floating rates play, paying like 20%, 30% APY, right? Fixed rate, yeah, you could get like 10%, but you know, people wanted something else because they, they have the appetite and the stomach to 
Yeah. And you even had the Anchor protocol, right? Yeah. Which was fixed 20%. 20%. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was actually a very... It, it, okay. The, the first guest on this podcast, which started online, was Matthew Canterry, the MD of Anchor Protocol. <laughs> very first guest ever. <laughs> oh, I, I must confess, I actually enjoyed Anchor Protocol. I mean, um, who didn't? Yeah. <laughs> who didn't? Yeah, absolutely. It was beautiful, right? Yeah. It was so easy to use. The pop- actually, the, yeah. 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 The UX was, yeah. I think, incredible. It was so easy to use. You didn't even have to. I mean, I could navigate it without having to go, th- go, go through a tutorial. And, and that, I think, is, is yeah, a gold standard when yeah. it comes to UI UX, right? Yeah. Um, I, I enjoyed it until, until I, I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, lost some money there, huh? <laughs> so, to, uh, I mean, who am I to say that? Like, I got completely wrecked on Luna. Yeah. And uh, even Anchor Protocol had a few hundred thousand dollars from uh, my data analytics company on there. Got 30 cents on the dollar. Back. You managed to claw some back, right? 30 cents? 30 cents on the dollar. But like, <laughs> but Luna, I lost way more than that. And it all went to zero. Damn, <laughs> I'm sorry to hear. So when Luna Happens, happened... When Luna happened, I was in California on the road and I couldn't access my device. Mm. So I, I took some hits as well. Yeah. Lesson learned. Always bring the device when you're going on a long road trip. For or, me. <laughs> or just buy Bitcoin ETH. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. And just do nothing with it. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. It. Buy Bitcoin ETH when it's bear market and then yeah. just... I, I think the challenge really became staying sane and not do stupid things. Absolutely. Uh, this week, we are releasing Raul Pal. Mm. Don't fuck this up, right? It's like the meme. Banana zone and don't fuck this up. Um, <clears throat> main thing we talk about is that. Yeah. The entire s- crypto, the entire system in crypto is to make it fuck this up. And what's really interesting is Pendle, right? I mean, we talk about V2 and points and all that stuff. But like, if you think very rationally about the points, it's these protocols, they basically want your liquidity and all that stuff, right? So they're basically gamifying the whole thing. Yeah. But if you think, and it's needed for innovation, for sure, right? Because if they don't have liquidity, they cannot do anything, right? But at the same time, if you think purely as a investor who doesn't want to fuck this up, what you're doing is the same, right? Buy Bitcoin ETH and just do nothing, right, with it. Yes, yes, yeah. So many, so many distractions. Everyone feels the need to take chances in crypto because they've seen someone made like a hundred X, a thousand X on some meme coins. I get that. I think the appeal is very strong, but realistically, I think most people don't have the luck to hit that jackpot. So most of us are actually better off just holding Bitcoin and ETH. And if you hit the jackpot, you're not going to sell. You're going to end up bag holder. <laughs> Because you wouldn't hit the jackpot. You're not going to go for the 100 or the 1,000x if you sell before, right? Exactly. But it also means if you didn't sell before, it's prob- you're probably not going to sell after, right? Yeah. Like, it's, <laughs> it's so, just... Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. And, yeah. and if you have such a sizable position, um, you become... It's, 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 it's also like the challenge is like it becomes very difficult to exit. Because when you exit, like let's say if, you are, if you're a significant holder, even 1% or 2% of a meme coin... Mm. Try exit is extremely difficult without without in influencing the market. Mm. Yeah, so so I think that's that's the challenge, and I think yeah because people who made it through meme coin they have a lot to say, right? Like and and everybody likes a good story like that. So these things get vocalized a lot more than the boring strategies mm. on on uh, Bitcoin ETH. The boring strategies that actually work. Yes. Yeah. I I, I learned it after several rounds of uh, getting wrecked by in, investing. Like first one was like the ICO days, right? Like I said, I think I would have done a lot better if not. If you just kept your ETH that you mind, right? Yeah. Yeah. Of we, course. We would have. Yeah. <laughs> so much better. <laughs> yeah. Terrible that exits. <laughs> but yeah, th- those were the days. I mean, we have to go through some of these experiences in order to appreciate like if you tell me today without any context that i have without any kind of wisdom um that i have learned 
through the years, if you tell me just stick with Bitcoin and ETH, I, I, I probably wouldn't trust you as much. It's the same with, uh, I mean, not same, but similar when you said before, <clears throat> I learned that not everyone should be an entrepreneur, right? Mm. You have to go through the entrepreneurship journey to realize, fuck, this is actually not for everyone. It's actually for almost no one, right? There's yeah. not many people who can do that. Yeah. And in crypto, it's the shit coin game <laughs> is the same, right? Yes. Everybody thinks, ah, and then they get wrecked and then they learn actually the shitcoin is, I think that's why Bitcoin maxis, I mean, now is less the case, but for so many years, they're just Bitcoin maxis so strong because they went through the shitcoin casino, yes. got wrecked, yes. realized, oh, I had that many <clears throat> Bitcoins. In, I mean, denominated in Bitcoin, Bitcoin mm. all these shitcoin were worth that many Bitcoin yeah. at the top. And I got so wrecked, right? And then they learned and that's why they basically became more and more maxi, I guess. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's possible. And um, I guess we all, uh, I guess we all go there. And uh, that's why also you don't want to involve your mother. Yes. Like that's why you do. One of the key points that I talked about with the Arthur, uh, Arthur Cheong mm. was someone who is really experienced in crypto, doing really well, will never ever recommend even his friends to buy any crypto because there is no upside to telling someone to buy crypto. Because if it goes up a lot, they are the genius. If it goes down, you are the asshole, right? Yeah. <laughs> and even if you tell them at the right moment to buy the thing, just buy Bitcoin, ETH in the bear market, you're gonna do Okay. 10X, yeah. whatever. They will fuck this up because they will not be, they, they won't be able to go against their kind of nature, which is I need to buy this shitcoin, I need to pay with it, I need to do that. So whatever, you, because you involve them first intense, right? It's kind of your fault. Yeah. Therefore, there is no upside to tell anyone, hey, you should do that. You can educate, whatever, but don't, I, I, I recommend you not to buy this thing. <laughs> like literally. Yeah, sure. Because you're gonna get wrecked with your own stupidity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 uh it's happened a lot more common com like a, a lot more um than than I like to think. Yeah, it, it's it's it, it really takes a lot of discipline mm. to resist the temptation of getting into a shitcoin. It takes a lot. <laughs> so you launched V2? Yes. Around the points, right? Yes. So actually V2 wasn't around the points. Mm. V2 was 2022 December. Um, like we, we were trying to figure out how to, cause like, I think at this point in time, in December, 2022, we had maybe $5 million in TVL. Mm. So for the entirety of last year, it was really trying to very painfully grind through the last year and trying to gain traction. Mm. So the strategy going into 2023 for us was actually just, uh, just just one type, uh, one mental model, right? And that, that is to stay relevant. We didn't have to care too much about the trading volume. We wanted to optimize for TVL. <clears throat> so in order to attract TVL, we had to figure out the big money movements and then slotting ourselves there. So the first implementation for us, uh, when it comes to like a more meaningful, um, meaningful narrative play was, was to set up a, uh, campaign with uh, Aura Balancer and Rocket Pool. We were small, they were much bigger. So we leveraged, and, and I mean, like, thank, 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 thanks to a lot of them, we were able to kind of um, rise from a pile of protocols that were written off already. Because I think we were dead at that point in time. We were three cents and we had like single digit TVL. <clears throat> and they because because of their endorsements we we somewhat became uh, a little more relevant so subsequently we continued on the same kind of strategy and we were looking for narratives and good partners to work with so that's been the strategy for the last year and even even for this year um, identifying good partners to work with is a key part of of our strategy we benefited drastically from uh ether Eigenlayers uh, cluster. Mm. And then we also benefited greatly from uh, Athena's rise to stardom as well. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, the, the points, uh, frankly, I did not expect the traction to be this significant. So I remember uh, this year, 
in my conversations with my teammates, I usually use Aave Compound as the blue chip standard because in the money market, everybody forks Compound, everybody forks um, Aave. So to me, they're like the blue chips that we look up to. So crossing the, like at one point in time, we became bigger than Compound. That was actually quite, quite a special moment for me. And then more recently, we also surpass a, a number of other protocols that I still have a lot of respect for. Um, I, I think that definitely felt, I mean, it feels extremely surreal that in, in such a short time frame of like five, six months, so much has changed. Do you want to give us some concrete numbers on like what happened in the last five months, where you were and where you are now? Yeah, sure. So last year, we... We were growing from, I'd say like $5 million in TVL at the start of the year to gradually, um, we picked at around 250 million. Mm. So that was, I think, already quite significant. The target was, I think we were looking at it from say, um, revenue perspective, right? Our target was actually, yeah, potentially 300 million. We didn't hit it. Mm. Um, but it was a good result nevertheless, because to grow from say a single digit TVL to several hundreds, it, it was um, I think quite encouraging. And I think the team has done a lot to experiment with different ideas. Look, we, we tried so many things, right? Like even though it's easy for me to say, like we try to identify the big money flows, the narratives, but we tried so many things that didn't, probably doesn't make a lot of sense. We, we, we were at one point in time, uh, the narrative positioning for us was a uh, low cap gem because we were like $10 million in FTV. Uh, we also experimented with NFTs uh, and, and the NFT marketplaces, right? So looks rare, mm -hmm. uh, Ape, Coin. So these were the different types of narratives that we wanted to affiliate Pendle with. Didn't work out as well. Um, but yeah, so, so I think for this year, we are currently approaching close to $7 billion in TVL. Mm. A bulk of that was because of um, the, the several protocols, right? The, the restaking protocols like Ether5, Renzo, uh, Kelp, uh, and then Itina is definitely a, a big contributor of the growth as well, and Zerkid more recently. So <clears throat> um, it was points. Points was the main catalyst for the product market fit. You said we went from 5 million in TVL to 7 billion. What does that represent in terms of uh, FDV? You said we were at 10 million. I don't know what it is today. I would think it's probably around one and a half billion to one point, something like that. Mm. Yeah, 1.7 billion. In, in terms of number of user count is also grown significantly as well. We used to have maybe one transaction every two days. Now we have thousands of transactions every day. So our daily trading volume has grown quite substantially as well. Last year, I think like around May last year, we would be very happy if we have 200, 300K in trading volume. So yesterday we have $182 million. So we average maybe around 100 to $200 million in trading, uh, daily trading volume this year. Mm. Uh, largely because of the uh, yeah YTPT interaction. So people who are bullish on points, they can express a view by buying YT. And then people who want fixed rates, they can buy the other side. And um, I think I think more recently we saw big whales, like for example, like Justin Sun. Mm. He's got his, um, I mean, these are all public, uh, pub public information. So... He, he's actually one of the biggest users of, of Pendle. And if, if I read it correctly, I think he's got a liking for fixed rates, which under, understandably so for his size, mm. uh, typically in the three digit million um, size, fixed rate of 20, 30% is actually quite a lot of money. Can you explain how the point thing came along? And yeah. especially you said it was not expected for us, right? That's probably one of the most in interesting points. So actually 
when we... So points wasn't exactly something new for us this year. When we work with Swell, Swell is one of the LSD protocols. Uh, we have a view on LSD protocols. That's why we work with a number of different issuers and Swell happens to be one of them. So in order to attract liquidity, Swell had their own system and they were issuing pearls, which is equivalent to points. So you deposit some asset on Swell, you get some pearls. And these pearls could eventually, on some days in the future, be exchanged for airdrop tokens. So this, this is, I think, uh, our first interaction with points. So we've had a, a uh, we've we've had last year to 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 work on something like that. So points isn't exactly a new novel concept for us, but Eigenlayer popularized it even like even more so this year, right? Because Eigenlayer when they started out, they were yeah basically just giving up points to early depositors as a way to bootstrap liquidity and to incentivize participation. And then end of last year, we were really thinking that Eigenlayer was really becoming quite quite meaningful in size. We need to work with them. So uh, we, we, we don't work directly with Eigenlayer. We work with um, LRT protocols like EtherFi and Renzo and Kelp because they're building on top of Eigenlayer. So they are offer, offering points as well. So for us, using the experience that we had last year, and incorporating like newer elements for uh, of points, and then we 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 basically just assign all the points to yield token. Um, so um, sorry, as a context, right? Pendle tokenizes a yield bearing asset like ETH into PT and YT. So the PT represents the principal token, mm. YT represents the yield token. Now, so principal token is generally the fixed fixed income, like the fixed rate, uh, sorry, fixed APY uh, component. So PT does not earn yield. It is um, it is the YT that earns the yield and the points. Now, so there is also a very important relationship between PT and YT because one PT plus one YT has to equal to the value of underlying. Now that means PT and YT are inversely related. Mm. So if PT demand increases, the price of PT would increase. And because it is inversely related to, uh, sorry, um, the demand for YT, if it increases, the YT price would increase. Mm. And because YT is inversely related to PT, when PT, uh, when YT price increases, PT price has to come down. Mm. So the, the, the more it, the, the, the more it comes down, the bigger the the discount is to the underlying. So this is where I think like um, it's structured something like a zero coupon and then users who value the fixed rate, they will just buy the PT, hold it until maturity to 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 earn, to redeem the underlying one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we, we, we basically like through the points, right? Because user has an anticipation for maybe how the points would work out because Eigenlayer being one of the biggest protocols today, they are number two after Lido. Uh, there's a lot of expectation that they would do very well, like from a FDV standpoint. And then on top of that, all the LRTs, the leading LRTs like EtherFi and Renzo, there is a lot of expectation on the performance of these tokens as well. So users who are bullish on these protocol performance, they would just by the YT because they want the points exposure. And, and and points exposure is not limited to just the LRTs. It's also eigenlayer points. So one time per chase gets exposure to two times um, the, 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 the points. And to top it up, to sweeten it, we've also negotiated for multipliers for a lot of these uh, points as well. So that means if you deposit one ETH into say EtherFi, you earn one time point. But if you deposit it through Pendle, you could get three times the points. So that is how we kind of funnel more liquidity to Pendle, which eventually ends up in the liquidity pools of all these LRT protocols. And the benefit uh, for us, sorry, the, the, the proposition for users is that like these assets can, can be more utilized and then the liquidity is generally more sticky as well. 
Um, so because of that relationship with PTYT, um, more, we, we see a lot more interest in the YT side. And as a result, the PT becomes more attractive. So we're talking about 40 to 60% in fixed APY on ETH. So the strategy is to serve the big players in the risk-taking field, right? Yes. We like figure one out- of a, the, One of the key focus. Mm, yeah, we figure out a way to work with them. And I think now the strategy is, is identify the best potential protocols to work with. And then from there on, construct a successful case study and then go to the other protocols to offer a similar kind of service. We are very neutral. We are primarily operating as a platform to help these protocols go to market and then bootstrap initial traction. So the plan on the risk-taking side is eigenlayer, right? And then you mentioned Karak and Symbiotic. Yes. So um, I think I think the restaking narrative is is very sound because it allows for users to generate more yield with the same asset. Um, Eigenlayer has already proven to be a very effective means to aggregate liquidity uh, and and yeah potentially offering like pretty attractive APYs to the users. So the upcoming alternatives like Karak and Symbiotic are good candidates that users can consider as well if they want to um, deposit their assets for additional APY. Um, and and, and we, we, will, we work with um, these alternatives and then provide an avenue for users to participate in their point systems. What's the potential for Pendo if you successfully manage to kind of pull this off, right? This risk-taking narrative. Yeah. I think I think we could look at tens of billions of dollars. Um, because yeah, just, just looking at Lido alone, Lido has $35 billion in mm -hmm. TVL. And I think a lot of that could be channeled to a restaking protocol. Because um Lido gives you the basic ETH staking yield, but the same asset could potentially be earning more yield. So I believe that in the future, maybe not too far from now, most people would actually prefer to stake their assets in a restaking protocol versus just um, something like Lido. Again, depending on their risk appetite, mm -hmm. right? You want something vanilla and safe, ETH staking yield uh, through Lido would, would be the play, but if you want to optimize for return with some risk exposure, then restaking protocols could be a uh, consideration. And, and for us, we are mostly just a facilitator of liquidity to these protocols. And I think the market potential for us, yeah, is easily in, in tens of billions of um, um, a, a dollars worth of assets. Mm -hmm. And I think to also touch on something else as well, right? Because we are also looking quite deeply into the Bitcoin ecosystem. Mm. Um, I personally think that Bitcoin being the single largest asset in the whole of crypto, even if we can capture maybe a percent of that, it represents big amount of value. Uh, my general thesis is that people who can utilize Bitcoin, sorry, my general thesis is that there will be a group of people who want to utilize their Bitcoin that is currently sitting dormant in their wallet mm. to generate wealth, to make it more productive. And we see that there are already quite a number of L1s and L2s showing up these days to really capitalize on this upcoming demand. Mm. Um, so this is a sector that we are also looking quite uh, deeply into and we want to be much more involved in this particular segment in the second half of the year, perhaps. What's the potential there for Pendo? I would also think it's probably tens of billions of dollars in value. Um, again, because even if we just look at, um, Bitcoin is one point something trillion in value. 1% of that is 10 billion. Mm. Yeah, assuming that we can capture 1% of the market, that, that in itself is, yeah, very sizable already. You mentioned Athena before. That was one of the 
key part in your growth lately, right? Mm. There's a part in this podcast where I ask the founders what their favorite teams are. And I know Athena is one of them. Why, why do you like the Athena team so much? I like that. I, I, I think their execution is superb. They, I mean, um, I've, we've worked with many teams. It's just a single out, uh, several, right? Itina comes to mind because they, they, they actually don't have a very big team, but they are managing quite a large sum of money. And I think take that aside, right? Logistically, uh, take the logistics parts aside. The fact that they are able to, they, I, I think they know their game plan really well because for stablecoin, I think the play is to increase adoption and they put themselves out there and work with a lot of these upcoming projects to accept USDE as a deposit asset, a uh, collateral for the points. So for example, uh, Symbiotic is something that is up and coming because of the backing from Paradigm and also the affiliation with Lido. So Athena figured out a way to make USDE a deposit asset for their upcoming campaigns. And I think that's that's really smart. And they do, th this is not the first time they've done it. They've done it with Karak. They've done it with uh, Zerkit, which is also pretty sizable in, in TVL, like 3.6, 3.7 billion dollars. So I think they're really executing very well uh, for a, an idea that is seemingly simple mm -hmm. with maybe two or three other products that are similar in nature in the past, but didn't work out. I think Athena is, yeah, they recognize that and they are focusing that as as big part, as a big part of their strategies. So a lot of respect to the team when it comes to their ability to execute. There's another one or two project that you really like. Yes, um, I I would I would I would give it to Monet. I think Monet is a very interesting one. So like internally, we think like my team, my, my team of developers think the tech is sound and in, in interesting. But for me, I am actually very impressed by the ability to construct a community when the product is not out. Because <clears throat> again, um, um, their, their team definitely embraces uh, memes and they put community first. So for, I think in my position, I've actually spoken with quite a lot of L1s and L2s. And I think not every founder thinks about go-to-market strategy the same way, uh, rightfully so, right? And most of the time, I realize that they actually take go-to-market for granted. So there is always this assumption that you build an L1 or L2, and if you have your peripheral infrastructure set up properly, like for example, your RPCs, your wallets and all these things set up, people will come to you naturally. But the fact is, it's never the case. From a protocol standpoint, as a protocol operator, the way we decide on the ecosystem to expand to is really by looking at liquidity. If an ecosystem has a million dollars compared to the other one with $10 billion, the, the natural choice is going to be the one with $10 billion, not the $1 million. <clears throat> so when it comes to L1, L2 development, I think um, far too many times, a lot of uh, product, like L1, L2 founders, they, they don't think about the go-to-market. And, and I think a key ingredient to, to, to go to market is actually community. You need to have that community so that you can attract initial batch of liquidity which can further compound because mm -hmm. when you have liquidity in the system, it becomes interesting for other infrastructure like wallets or uh, protocols like Uniswap, whichever it is, right? To also build, build on top of um, that L1. And I think Monet has it right in aggregating community interest first. When they're alive, I'm actually reasonably sure that there will be a decent amount of liquidity that will that will that will deposit into um, their campaigns. Um, so again, 
we, we talk about attention, right? Mm. Crypto is, is a game of attention. Monet so far has done really well with community. They've got some key hires, right? No, no, no doubt about that, who really understand crypto culture very well, like CMS intern. Um, mm. The the guy who pioneered the intern concept in crypto. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think that's definitely very respectable uh, for, for him to to want to work on something. I think Kione must have done something right to attract talents like that to, to join his team. He told me on this podcast that uh, their approach has always been that the actual product is the community. Mm. It's not the actual... He says, yeah, the, te the technology needs to work, <clears throat> of course, but the actual key product, right? The key focus, the most important thing, see from day one is the community. Yes, yes. And, and they, they, they really are nailing it. And you can just like, so I was in GM Vietnam mm. uh, maybe a week ago. I went to their event. They hosted like, the Monet, there, there was a Monet community in Vietnam that self-hosted the event and, and like uh, Kione and, and his team went over. Not just that, right? I think they were able to attract a decent crowd to show up there. The Monet community members from other countries in the region also showed up in the event, like the ones in Korea, the ones in Thailand. So I, I thought that was actually pretty, pretty incredible. Mm. Especially for something that doesn't have technology out there yet, right? Yet, yet, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it will come. <clears throat> I, I I think to also, if I can, I, I, I'd like to also highlight EtherFi. I think EtherFi is also an execution beast. And I think they deserve all the traction that they have today. So they are they are also one of the largest protocols out there now. Mm. Six something billion dollars. When we knew them, I think they were only double digit millions. Um, the, 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 the synergy between us and EtherFi has been very, very strong, but looking at the way they churn out products and the way they manage community is, um, is also, I think a good case study for, for, for me personally, and also the other, uh, protocol founders, um, across the different protocols, I think they have one of the best communications um, with the community, very clear, direct, usually no, no rooms for confusions. Yeah. <clears throat> so before we started this podcast, we talked about Singapore, Japan, India, and Japan is definitely an interesting one for you and for me. <laughs> it's one of our favorite cuisine, right? Yeah, yeah. You're a foodie. You love eating well. Yes. And appreciating fine food. Yes. Which I think is the case probably for a lot of people, especially those who did well in life, right? Mm. But you also go much deeper. And now I understood why, because you told me yes. your, your wife is a chef, right? Yes. So we actually share... Uh, our, both our favorite cuisine, which is Peruvian and Japanese. Mm. So let's take each of them and try to understand why they're so good. Because it's actually something I never thought about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. you thought about it, right? Yeah. So again, I credit all these things to my wife because mm. she is she was a chef and now she's an educator in the culinary field. So she she knows a lot more than I do and I'm learning from her all the time. And, and she's actually one of the reasons why I think not everyone should do entrepreneurship. And I'll tell you why. So she likes, we, she likes to host big groups of people, right? So we usually have, like in the past, we usually have, um, I'd say in the past because we used to have a bigger space. Now we move to a smaller space. We are going to move to a new place again that we'll start hosting it. And she likes to host big groups of maybe eight to 10 people. And usually... She would do all the dishes on her own. And she always says cooking is very easy. But the fact is, it's not. And, and like I can follow the instructions as clearly as I can, but I will never make the same kind of food that tastes like, like what she did. So, so 
I think a lot of it is actually flair and experience. Uh, like you have to be really good in in cooking, the organization, the thinking of the the menu, and pairing of ingredients, right? Between say lime and like something else, you pair them. You think about the 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 profile of the different foods and how you make something better than the individual components that requires flair. And because of her and watching her commenting about cooking, I decided that I am not a good chef. I will never be a good chef and I respect her for that. And in the same way, that concept applies to entrepreneurship as well mm. because of her. But let's come back to Peruvian. Peruvian. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we were in, in, in Peru. I think um, one of the biggest draws for us, right, to Peru was, um, firstly, it was it was all like more gimmicky. We, we are devoted uh, followers of the 50 best list. And last year in 2023, I think Lima has the highest number of entries across the world in the 50 best. So for me, who's never been, someone who's never been to South America, I, I, I have a certain impression of South America. It's maybe not as advanced. Uh, most of the countries are still developing. But for, for these countries, uh, like Peru to be specific, right? To have four entries in the 50 best list against so many other culinary destinations like France or Japan or several others, there's got to be a reason. So mm -hmm. we went there to check out. Um, and I think, of course, like with the benefit of having an educator next to me, I learned that Peru has is, is, is probably the only place with uh, deep sea tropical rainforests and high altitudes. And because of that, you have a big range of ingredients that you can combine, right? Like just talking about Peru, um, sorry, just talking about corn and potatoes, Peru has probably thousands of different varieties there. So that different, that that diversity is is quite critical to the Peruvian cuisine. Over here, we only know like, corn, white corn, like sweet corn, white corn, maybe yeah, a couple of others, but mm. they have two, some, I think close to 3000 different varieties of corn. Um, that, that to me was, was extremely refreshing because you see purple corn, black corn and, uh, and different shades of corns. Mm. Uh, I thought it was incredible. And then potatoes as well. So, and then if you combine that with the history of Peru, where of course, like, uh, it all started with like the Inca empire. And then Spanish, um, they, they were a Spanish colony and had a lot of uh, Spanish influence. And then they also had a huge influx of Japanese and Chinese uh, migrants. And that, that um, mix of different cultures resulted in very interesting uh, profiles of food. So combine that with the ingredients, the ingredient choices, I think it makes like there are tastes in Peru that you can never find mm. anywhere else. <laughs> That's why it's so interesting. And I, I could relate to that when I was there. Um, we had amazing foods there. Really incredible. Yeah. There you go. That's <laughs> why... That's why per Peruvian restaurants are our favorite ones, right? Yeah. I mean, it's an amazing... Um, it's a great, it's a great explanation and understanding of the something that I just was not aware of. I was just like, how come Peruvian food is so amazing? Yeah. Because it is, right? Yeah, it is. Another one that is really amazing is for me and for you, Japanese. Yes. Japanese is, is interesting because Japan has an interesting culture of trying to perfect things, right? So this, this May, I was in Tokyo for, for about a week. Um, we went to Karuzawa and if you're a whiskey drinker, you would probably be familiar with Karuzawa distillery. So it, 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 it shattered in 2000, 2001. So the existing bottles of Karuzawa is very expensive. So now there is a revitalization of the brand under different ownership. So we visited that, that distillery. The amount of depth that they went into trying to replicate uh, like the past successes is, is incredible. The culture, sorry, the, the, the climate is important for sure. The, the source of water 
it's it's coming from like a, a, a mountain in, in, in the region. Um, and then the the barley types, they're all imported. So I think like they they have a I, I've, I'm always amazed by Japanese. When they take someone else's culture, they can sometimes do things that exceed even the the the, the origin. Uh, another example, so I, I had a really good time checking out the distilleries. Uh, another good example was actually pizza. I've always had the impression that the Italians make the best pizza, no doubt about that, right? Mm. But the Japanese make incredible pizza too. Sometimes they don't do too much fancy things to it. Sometimes they add their own interpretation. And most of the time, they end up really well because you can taste the Italians in the pizza and you can also taste the Japanese in the pizza. Uh, and and this this recent trip, I also visited a, 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 a French Japanese restaurant, and I had the single. Uh, this 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 restaurant must be the um, the one that's that that serves the most memorable steak that I've ever had, because they use sanda beef, which is the crown jewel of uh, wagyu, and grilled it using French techniques. And the result was incredible. I I have a lot of respect for food, but maybe not as much as the Japanese when it comes to food. <laughs> so, there you go. What's your next destination? I think this year it's still it's still going to be Japan, but mm. next year we will probably check out China. What's your biggest prediction for next twelve months? Next 12 months, I'm actually going to put it on Pendle. I think we will come out with, we're working on a new product. I think it can be game changing. In what, in what way? New use cases that is not possible right now. Do you want to elaborate a bit on that? I guess, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not the best. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a lot to say, but I'm not sure if I should say it. <laughs> That's why the prediction. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing this, man. That was a great conversation. <laughs> Thanks for having me.